Welcome back. This is uh, lecture 14, and uh, we're still on page 14. I think we, yeah, we might have actually gone through like a whole page almost. Um, I want to talk just a few minutes before we go on to the next um, statement in reference to um, titles of the Lord Jesus, because we looked at the word Lord, L-O-R-D, and uh, I want to talk about Lordship, all right, just as... Um, has nothing to do with um, deity of Christ or anything like that, but it just kind of lends itself to this conversation uh, just very briefly, okay? Um, Jesus is Lord. Uh, we, we see that in Scripture, okay? Um, many, many, many years ago, um, there were several books written. This would have been back in the um, what, late 80s, early 90s. Um, there were some books written. John MacArthur was a key proponent of what's uh, often referred to as lordship salvation. Anybody ever heard that term before? Lordship? Okay. And, and so um, he was a big proponent of what he called lordship salvation. Um, of course, um, there were folks that, you know, after reading his stuff, kind of jumped on the, on the other side. Uh, folks like uh, Charles Rory. Uh, Charles Stanley, uh, Chuck Swindoll, um, all these Charleses. It was the Charles thing, I guess. Um, there, and, and many others, all right? They said, well, listen, we got, we got, we got issues with your definitions and, and your statements. I will say this. It sold a lot of books because these guys, they were just like shooting books out there. Bookstores were carrying, you know, like, you know, here's, here's this one side and this is the other side, which side is right, buy these books and, you know, choose for yourself. Um, the, the, whole, the whole thing, and, and okay, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it always amazes me that there's a lot of theological discussion that's kind of polarized. You're, you're either this or you're that. Right? It's kind of like you're, you're either a Calvinist or you're an uh, Arminian, you know. And, um, you know, I, I am not the kind of person that likes, you know, just jumps inside of a camp and says, this is what I am, okay? And, um, you know, I, I believe, it's like, I believe what the Bible says, you know? Um, I, don't have, I don't need uh, some camp to define my doctrine, and I certainly don't jump on people's bandwagons. Um, you know, I was, I was actually in Bible college when, when, uh, when this whole thing was raging. So that was like, you know, we call it snack shop theology. You know, when you go down to the snack shop and, and uh, eat a hot dog and drink a soda and talk about deeper theological things, you know. But um, um, when, when MacArthur was writing about lordship, what he was, what he was responding to was the, the type of stuff that still goes on today. In other words, um, you know, when you when you get when somebody gets when you when you have an opportunity of leading someone to Christ, um, you know, you want them to accept who Jesus Christ is, and, and to pray and, and ask God to, to you know save them in faith, which is you know which is fine. But MacArthur was noticing the trend, which still goes on today, of what's often referred to as easy believism. Okay. In other words, recite this prayer, you know, the, you got your ABCs, right? You know, all, you know, yeah, you know, you got to, you got to, uh, you know, admit that you're a sinner, believe on Jesus Christ and call upon his name. You break it down to a formula, pray the sinner's prayer. And, uh, but what, ha what happened and what MacArthur was seeing is what like a lot of people see is that people were making professions of faith and yet there was no change in their life. Okay. So he identified this as the fact that people were not accepting, they were accepting that Jesus was the Christ, but they were not accepting the fact that he was Lord, that they now were responsible to actually follow him and, and do what Christ is saying to do. And so he's saying, listen, you need to accept that Jesus is not only Christ, but he's also Lord, Lordship, salvation. And so then you have the other folks on the other side, you know, like Chuck Swindoll and, and others, Chuck, and, and all the other Charleses out there, that use, would use terms like free grace and things like that. He would say, well, listen, you know, you don't have, this idea of having to accept Jesus as Lord is almost like a works. It's kind of like saying, well, I've got to, I've got to accept all this teaching 
and I've got to, I've got to come in line. If Jesus is Lord, then I've got to come in line with, my, with obedience before I have salvation. And so they're, they're going over the sack saying, no, we believe in free grace, and you know, God's going to, for, you used to say you believe, and God's going to give you salvation. And so, so the fight rages on, right? And so, and so this, was, this was back in you know, early 90s, and that went on for a long time until I guess they ran out of books to sell. And then you know, the argument kind of dropped away, and I, I haven't heard about it in a long time. Um, you know, um, I would ask this question, okay? When, when, a person is, when a person is saved, do they have to make Jesus the Lord of their life? So that's, that's the question. Do they have to make Jesus the Lord of their life? Uh, and so MacArthur would say, well, yes, you do. And the others would say, well, no, you don't. Um, you know, my, my position on that is we don't make Jesus anything. Exactly. He is. He is Lord. True salvation is not a... For us, when we get saved, true salvation is not us elevating Jesus to a position. He is always there. We are simply acknowledging that position and, and accepting that as truth. So when I got saved, I, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so, um, did I have a full understanding of who he was? No, not at all. I, I certainly didn't. But I understood that he was the Son of God. And at that, you know, at that moment when I got saved, um, my rec my, I was not making him Lord of my life, but I was recognizing the fact that he was Lord. And so uh, I, will, I, will certainly, I will certainly accept what MacArthur says in reference to the fact that, because he wrote that book as a response to what he saw as a fallacy in the evangelism back in back in the in the late '80s, um, of course, um, you know during that period of time there was a lot of uh, you know the soul winning type of hy what I call hyper evangelism. That, that's the term, that's that's one of that's my term, okay? And so hyper evangelism, um, where you know folks are just going out getting people to pray prayers. Um, I and mean, I knew some folks like that. You know, they would they would go out every Saturday. They'd come back, and I, you know, I like twenty seven people saved this this you know this past Saturday, and you know, it's like notches on their little Bible belts, you know, and um, you know that that type of stuff went on all the time. It still does. Okay, um, I I certainly understand what MacArthur is saying because that that's a response to that mentality. That people really need to understand that salvation is more than praying a prayer. It is understanding who Jesus Christ is and accepting Him as Lord and you know Lord and Christ. Accepting that Jesus Christ is uh, is the Lord. We don't make Him Lord, and I think that is where everybody was you know having fits on the other side. And I and I agree with that. We do not make Him Lord. He is Lord. And so um, that was a big uh, that was a big thing, and um, I, I don't I don't hear the terms as much anymore. Um, you know, it's been a long time since I've heard somebody arguing about lordship salvation, so it's not something that you're going to hear about as often. But the but the principle is still there. Is that when we talk about we talk to people about salvation, we have to make sure they understand this Jesus that they're going to that they want, we want them to accept as Savior is more than just a title, you know, but he, he, he is the Son of God. And, you know, you're going to turn your life over to him. Everything's going to change. Um, we don't make him Lord, but everything is going to change because he is Lord. And so by accepting who Christ is, the, the, the intent is that a life is transformed and not just... You know, and not just, you know, you pray the prayer and you're a Christian. We don't make people Christians, okay? Um, so that was, that was a, a big debate um, several, several decades ago. Um, and so, and it's centered around this idea of, of Lord. The next one I want to talk about tonight, uh, letter C, 
uh, is the word, let me see, that was, that was letter C, right? And so uh, are we on the next page here, letter D? That's correct, and that would be the word. The word. You'll see the scriptures there. And of course, John 1, 1 and 1, 2. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Um, in verse number 14 uh, says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that verse uh, from 1 John um, 1, 1. First, uh, the epistle. Uh, Brother Carlos, do you have that? If you would please, uh, from 1 John. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. All right, he re uses that term, the word of life, in particular, um, in, in reference to that. And um, uh, I'm just going to read, uh, Jesus was the word in that he was a, the, um, and this is a, a term that I have here in my notes. He, he perfectly revealed the Father. And that's, you know, when we talk about words, we're talking about communication, an expression of something. And so he perfectly revealed the Father. Jesus was the most glorious expression of God to mankind. Jesus was the most glorious expression of God to mankind. Um, let me see, who wrote this one? I got another note here. This title seems to be from the Hebrew concept of the word being essential communication. Jesus was the word in that he perfectly revealed the Father. And that's pretty much the same thing that I just said. And, and so, um, so when we talk about the word, um, we're talking about an expression. Now this is, um, if you remember from some of the Gnostic stuff we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, some of the Gnostic teaching was that this word that Jesus did not exist in eternity past, but it was the concept of the word, and that this word, the concept, became reality when Jesus uh, came down to this earth. And that's a, that's a Gnostic interpretation of what word means. And that's, that's not it at all. It is simply that he is this, you know, here, here is Jesus on this earth, and he's revealing the Father to us. So he becomes this tremendous expression of what God is. And we use that, that term is used by God to show that expression. And so this is not some type of form of Gnosticism. It's not a concept, um, but it is the reality of what God is trying to accomplish through his son, Jesus Christ, as being the word of God, okay? Um, let's uh, go to the next one here. And that's, uh, is that the letter E? And that would be Emmanuel, E for Emmanuel. Boy, that's, that worked out really well, didn't it? What, is he, what does Emmanuel mean? God with, God with us. us. God with us. That'll preach, won't it? And so um, the uh, verse of scripture there from Matthew 123, of course, um, thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, um, God with us. And that is, um, of course, a quote from the Old Testament. And um, let's see here. There it is. Yeah, it, that's from that's from Isaiah chapter seven, verse number fourteen. Um, so Matthew one twenty three uh, relates back to Isaiah seven fourteen. Since I got that right, and um, I'm going to read a note. This is this is this note is from uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown again, and uh, Mr. J F B. Um, I'm just going to read directly what I have here in my notes here. Not that he was to have this as a proper name. In other words, you know, it wasn't like, you know, get a t-shirt that says right up top here, Emmanuel. Okay, it's not a proper name at all like Jesus. But that he should come to be known in this character as God manifested in the flesh and the living bond of holy and most intimate fellowship between God and man from henceforth and forever, okay? You don't need to write all that down, but I'll read it again just for the fun of it. Not that he was to have this as a proper name like Jesus, but that he should come to be known in this character. That is, you know, God with us, that's a character. As God manifest in the flesh and having, um, excuse me, the living bond of holy and most intimate fellowship between God and man from henceforth and forever. And that, that's a quote out of Jameson Fawcett and Brown's uh, theology work, okay? The last uh, title 
uh, that's the uh, letter F there, is the Holy One. The Holy One. Now we're gonna, you're gonna find that, um, uh, look, at, look at Acts chapter three and uh, verse number 14. Brother Stephen, if you would please. But you deny the Holy One and the just and desire the murderer to be granted unto you. Okay, and so this is a term we see here in Acts chapter three. We're gonna find it in some other places also. Um, um, the main emphasis behind this is the fact that it's a term that's used a lot in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, um, um, you guys with the computers running there, could you just do a word search in the Old Testament and uh, like for instance, a holy one? You could leave the the off of it because it'll, it'll show up as uh, thine and, um, and thee and, and a couple other ways too. But if you look up holy one in the Old Testament, what you're gonna find, um, you're gonna find several references. You'll find a gob of references in the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah loves that term, and he's gonna use that term a lot in reference uh, to God. And it's gonna primarily say the Holy One of Israel, okay? So it's a relationship to God's people. And so the Holy One is a term that it is used a lot in the scriptures. Um, it's, um, um, let's see here. Um, Brother Sean, if you would, um, Psalm 1610. Um, Sister Rachel, if you would, Acts 227. And um, Brother John, if you would, um, uh, Acts 1335. And I'm going to go to the book of Habakkuk. You ready? Yes, sir. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Okay, so that is uh, from Psalm 16, and then that's quoted in, and this is a sermon that's being preached on the day of Pentecost, and in reference to Jesus Christ, okay? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, and then he goes on and explains the fact that that's not talking about David, because, you know, David's dead, you know? So um, he's making reference to the fact that this reference back in the Old Testament is speaking about Jesus Christ. And then John 13, John, from Acts 13, <laughs> verse number 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. All right, and so the connections made there between this Old Testament passage and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read one more uh, passage, and that's in Habakkuk uh, chapter 1 and verse, let um, me see, verse number 12, which says this, um, um, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, uh, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord, that has ordained them for judgment and almighty God and has established them for correction. And here again, we see the term holy one, which has already been linked to Jesus Christ. And we see in particular here in Habakkuk that he is referring to him as that he's from everlasting, that he's, he's called, O Lord, my God, mine holy one. And so it's a, a direct, we're talking about statements and titles in reference to Jesus Christ, which elevate his deity. And certainly this term holy one is something that is, uh, that is often used to do that. And so, um, so holy one is, is there. Now, you know, basically uh, in, uh, in summary, we're gonna talk about divine attributes in just a second here, but uh, basically in summary, um, you know, um, these names and titles, they apply to Jesus Christ. Um, those that use them, um, you know, understood the significance of them, especially when we talked about terms like Son of God. Um, when, when it was used, they, they, they understood what Jesus Christ was trying to say about himself. And so we see this, at these titles play through in the scriptures. Um, they... Um, the, the fundamental concept of God was, uh, you know, there, there, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament, as Jesus is speaking to the Jews, 
their understanding of the concept of God is that there was one God. Christ was not presenting himself as an alternative. He wasn't saying, you know, you know, here's God the Father, and I'm, you know, I'm something different here. It was not it at all. He was not doing that. Um, he, they, they were monotheistic. They believed in this, this, uh, this one God. And so Christ was making himself equal with God. Not a distinct God, but equal with God. And so, uh, of course, you know, for that, they want to, you know, basically they wanted to kill him for that. But if he is God, and he says he's God, and he's, you know, presented as being God, then he needs to be worshipped as God. And so this is where, you know, we see his, uh, his apostles saying, we understand this, and they, they, they understand the fact that he is God. And this is where those that were opposed to him really began to get extremely angry about it because that because that, that's where the, the blasphemy comes in. This is where they decide, hey, when we start talking about things that he did, like he forgave sin, you know, no one can forgive sin but God. And, you know, you even see statements like, you know, good master, and he says there's none good but, but one, and that's God. And so, you know, you see statements like this where people are, are kind of coming to grips with the fact that, you know, Jesus is not just, um, you know, a good person, but he's claiming to be God. And if he is God, then he needs to be worshipped as God. And so those that would refuse that call it blasphemy and they want him dead. Those that are willing to accept that, they're truly born again. And, and so, so, you know, based on the, the titles themselves, you know, Jesus is either a liar or he's actually Lord in Christ. And, and so... Um, this is, uh, this is where uh, we begin to see, um, this, this is where we begin to see the friction, and that is that acceptance of who Jesus Christ is as, as God, okay? Um, the next couple, the next things we're going to be talking about are characteristics, okay? And so um, these next uh, few pages, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce them a little bit, um, and then um, I don't think we... We don't have an assignment to do next week, do we? Oh, good, because I'll, I'll give you one, all right? Because I, I know you'd get bored otherwise. But um, uh, we're going to talk about characteristics, okay? Um, oh, that bounced real good. All right. Um, communicable and non-communicable, all right? So... Um, Let's, let's talk about this for just a minute before we start getting into this list. Divine attributes uh, point to the deity of Christ. And so we'll, uh, let me just read through this note real quick. In theology proper, who God is can be observed in the scripture through his attributes, okay? So if we believe that God reveals himself through the word of God, then we are going to look for what God is like by seeing some of the things that he does. So we develop a list of attributes. This is what God is like, okay? These attributes can generally be divided into two categories. They're, in here, it's referred to as natural and moral attributes. The technical term for it is communicable and non-communicable, okay? That's why I wrote that on the board there, all right? Um, in some sense, man is able to partake of more of the moral attributes, and that would be the communicable attributes. And then the natural attributes of God are non-communicable. All right, we'll talk. We're going to be talking about those. Okay, um, for instance, God is holy. Um, you know, the Book of Hebrews it says, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." So, holiness is one of the main attributes of God, but it's communicable. So, in other words, because God is holy, we can be holy. So we can share. What's, a, what's another communicable attribute of God? Love. Excellent example. Because God is love, right? And so because God is love, you know, we are expected then to love like God loves. So God has this, you know, perfect, what's often referred to from the Greek word there, the agape, agape love. It's, it's selfless. It is, it's, it's, it's not, 
It's not driven by motivation. Like in other words, I, the only reason I'm loving is because, you know, I love my wife. Why do I love my wife? Because she's a great cook. Okay. I mean, that may be true, um, but God doesn't love us because of something that we do. So he loves in spite of us. So that's a communicable attribute, the fact that, that but because of our relationship with God, now it elevates um, how we love or how we respond to others, okay? It's selfless and you know, not, it's not responsive, but it's a, it's, a, it's a character that we have, we love. That's communicable. And so there are many other communicable attributes that God has. But not all of God's attributes are communicable. In other words, they are, they are uh, as the term here, we have those you know, moral attributes and natural. Okay? Moral attributes are the communicable ones. God is holy, we should be holy. God is love, we should be loved. God is merciful, we should show mercy. And, and so, um, but then God has non-communicable attributes. In other words, there are certain things that God is that we will never be. I will never be all-knowing, okay? I mean, I can study and study and study. I can read lots of books, but I'm never going to be all-knowing. I'm learning new things every day, especially when you have, you know, like a six-year-old in the house and she's teaching you all kinds of stuff, all right? I just, things I never knew before. I just love it every bit of it, okay? And so, um, Man, they're going to be moving in a couple weeks, by the way. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to be quiet around the shorter household. But um, the, um, this idea of communicable and non-communicable is, is a dividing line between characteristics that we share with God because of our relationship with Him and attributes that only God has. So if there are attributes that only God has, it would, it would make sense that if Jesus is God, that he is going to possess the same non-communicable attributes. So, you know, if, if, if Jesus was only, you know, only had holiness and love and mercy like we would, then he, he is, he's not God. He's attaining to the things that God has just like we can, right? But if he has attributes that only God would have, then he would then he is God. And, and so the, uh, the this list that's going on from here is speaking about um, uh, attributes, non-communicable or um, um, natural attributes. That's the the term that's used in our notes here is natural and moral. Moral is communicable. Natural is non-communicable. All right. So if, if Christ has those, okay, the natural, uh, the natural, app, out, uh, I'm continuing the notes here, the natural attributes, however, are non-communicable uh, and belong to God only. New Testament clearly portrays Jesus as possessing the natural attributes of God. The first one is self-existence, self-existence. We'll go over this and we'll take a short break and we'll finish up uh, for tonight. Um, um, by self-existence, we're taught, uh, we, uh, by, by definition, the source of his existence is wholly within himself and depends on nothing else. The source of his existence is holy, that's with a W by the way, is holy within himself and depends on nothing else. Holy within himself and depends on nothing else. One second, let me get down my notes here. There we go. <clears throat> and so, when we speak about God the Father, you know, where, where are we introduced to God in the Scripture? Where are we first introduced to God in the Scripture? Genesis 1. Which says... In the beginning, God. I mean, it's there is a there is an assumption of the uh, of the self existence of God, um, and so before in the beginning, we're talking about the beginning of all things that we know about. There's God. 
That's self-existence. And, and so when we see a scripture, for instance, like John chapter 1 and verse number 4, and uh, I have no idea who read it last, so uh, we're just going to pick on somebody. So uh, I think it's my turn. Okay, brother. Thank you for volunteering. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay. And so the, the very fact that, that life itself is found in the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that without Christ there is no, there's no life. There is, there's nothing that is alive. And so we have this um, presumption that existence is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then uh, I'll give you another verse, and that's uh, John. Um, let's see here. Um, I had a couple here. So, like for instance, John fourteen six, where Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the and the life." That, that that idea of life is is without Christ, there is no existence. Um, here, give you another one, John eight and forty eight, and uh, and brother Stephen, if you would, John eight four. Uh, excuse me, not forty eight, fifty eight. John eight fifty eight. Um, and there's a term that Jesus uses here, and if you would please. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. And he uses that, that statement, that I am statement, um, and that's, you know, that's a big deal. Um, let's see here, where did I have that written down at? I had a note somewhere about that, and I don't even know where I left it at. Is that, that's not even in here. Um, Moses and the Book. I know it. I had. Yeah, it was just you know, right before class. I was reading something about the I am statement found. Uh, oh, okay. Um, this, this, you know, the term I am, as a matter of fact, it was had to do with uh, the term Jehovah. And um, let's see. Excuse me, one second. I should have put something in there because I was reading that going, man, that's really good stuff. I'll preach. And so, is that it right there? Oh. Yeah, well, never mind. Forget I even, forget I even brought it up. It's going to bug me now until I find that note I was reading earlier. Um, let's see here. Well, this is what he says about that, because there was a note on Jehovah I was reading, and uh, this is what uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer uh, says about the, the I am from John 8, and he says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That, of course, is from Deuteronomy 6, 4. That's the Shema, you know. And um, the Jews, that's, their, that's the Jews, John 3, 16, that they, uh, their favorite verse. Um, a, tra uh, a translation just as acceptable might, might be this, and he has this in reference to this term. Is, uh, of course, Shema, Shema O Israel, uh, that the Lord, which is Jehovah, Jehovah, uh, note the name is singular. Jehovah is a singular noun. Um, our, is our Elohim. Elohim is, of course, plural. Um, is one, meaning several entities united as one. He is one Jehovah. So Jehovah, our Elohim, is one Jehovah. Jehovah singular, our Elohim plural, is one Jehovah. Um, what therefore must be significant about Christ's reference to himself as Jehovah or as the I am of John 8, 58. And claiming to be I am makes him equal, of course, with, uh, with God is uh, what the statement is. The I am, of course, is the Jehovah who, uh, if that, of course, is the burning bush making that reference, you know, who sent me the I am. I am that I am, and that's talking about that self-existing one, and that's that term that we see in the Old Testament, uh, there in the book of Exodus chapter 3, and then the Christ is making parallel to that. And so, by self-existence, we're talking about the fact that Jesus re, um, refers to himself 
in the same way as God the Father does, that he, he identifies the fact that he had no origin, that he always existed, and that he is the singular God, and, and that there's none other. And so this is a term, uh, or an attribute, that is self-existence, which only God has. Only God is self-existent. There is nothing else um, that has that ability uh, to claim it. Everything else is created. And so, um, if Jesus was a created being, if he lacked self-existence, as the you know Jehovah's Witnesses would say, of course that you know that uh, that uh, Arianism doctrine, um, then he would not be God because self-existence is a key characteristic of God. All right, we're going to stop right there. We'll take a break, and we've got uh, we've got thirty whole minutes left to fit into our next lecture.